experts, coaches, and athletes can all agree that at the very top, it's not just about who's the strongest lifter. It's about who's the best competitor mentally. But you don't need to be elite in order to see wicked gains by working on your mental game. My name is Julia, I'm a weightlifting coach and an athlete, and in this video, I'm gonna share with you my top five favorite books on mental training for athletes. And the key takeaways you can start implementing today to see better performances. So I've been coaching for over half my life. I started coaching gymnastics when I was 15, and one of the things I started to learn about on my own very early on was the mental side of athletics. I really struggled to get some athletes in the gymnastics space to overcome certain mental blocks. So I invested a lot of time in understanding that process better. And I use those same tactics a lot now with my weightlifters. But ultimately competition tests us not only physiologically, but also psychologically. Now I know that the idea of reading about sports psychology or mindset training may not be the sexiest thing and maybe not why you're on this channel at all, but that's why I've created this video to distill some of that information to you. I've also created an additional resource called No Pressure, No Diamonds. It's my ebook that takes all of this information that I've gathered over the years from working with coaches, working with athletes, reading books, articles, and everything I could on the subject matter, and presenting you with some of the most important takeaways of how to develop your mental game as an athlete. So if you want to learn more about that, you can find it in the link down below. Okay, my first recommendation is Mind Gym by Gary Mack. This was actually the first book on mindset training that I read. It's a great entry point book for some of this subject matter and there are actionable steps in there, right? It's not super duper esoteric. So the first big key point that Gary Mack breaks down is one, we have to accept where you currently are. If you are unrealistic about where your current state of performance is, it's gonna be really hard to develop a plan of how to move forward with that. Second is create your ideal, right? Once we understand where where we are, we have to know where we want to go. So that comes in the form of long-term goal setting initially, and then we are going to break that down, obviously, into shorter-term goals. But having a very clear vision of what it is you want to accomplish in the next year, in the next five years with your athletic career, gives us a launching point to developing that plan. And then third is take action. This seems really, really simple. If you have a starting point and you have a goal you want to get to, it's not enough to draft it out, right? Ideally, this is a communication between you and your coach, but it's important that you take accountability for yourself and really take action on the things that are holding you back the most. Another really big point is breathe and focus. So this was really the first time that I'd started to hear about breath control in terms of managing performance anxiety. And he made a great point that it's really hard to be simultaneously really stressed out and simultaneously really relaxed. So physiologically, if your body gets to a point where it can be a little bit more relaxed, then that decreases the amount of psychological stress and anxiety that you're experiencing. That also works the other way around. If you need to get yourself a little bit more hyped up, if you're not not quite in that mental space, then amping yourself up physiologically, even just manipulating your breath to breathe shallower and more frequently is gonna elevate that heart rate. It's gonna shift you into that more aroused state. So using breath and controlling it and manipulating it is a really important tactic. Mind Gym also really talks about the importance of confidence and this comes up a lot. You're gonna see this in a lot of books about sports performance, about sports psychology, confidence, having that intense trust in yourself to have the ability to complete a task, to achieve a goal, to realize a purpose. And that's why in my book, No Pressure, No Diamonds, I spend a whole chapter talking about what it is, how to build it, because it's so integral to your success. And then the last big point from this that I'm gonna leave you with is consistency. Here's the deal. Great athletes are more consistent than mediocre athletes. If you want to be better, you need to be more consistent with everything, with your training, with your nutrition, with your recovery, all of those pieces need to happen with consistency. Book number two, we have With Winning in Mind by Lanny Basham. So I like this one because Lanny is a Olympic sports shooter. Uh, that may not seem like there's a lot in common with weightlifting. Obviously, we've got something that relies heavily on fine motor skills versus something that relies more on gross motor skills. However, the precision required and the finite amount of attempts that one has correlates a lot to the way that weightlifting is competed as a sport. 
So early on in the book, Lanny mentions that performance is 90% mental. When your outcome is so heavily dependent on your psychological state, it's important that you train it the same way you train your body. Instilling a mental practice into your training is part of replicating consistent performances. Uh, I also really like this coming from Lanny. He says that process is primary, which means we need to focus on the moment to moment. And this, again, that, that sport shooting and weightlifting have a lot in common in that it's easy to focus on outcome, which is I wanna hit this weight, I wanna hit this total, I want to get this many bullseyes. I don't really know how sport shooting is scored, so bear with me. But that takes us away from the process, which is primary to accomplishing that end goal. If you wanna hit this number in the snatch, what do you need to do in order to do that? Do you need to stay a little tighter off the ground? Do you need to finish more violently? Do you need to complete your turnover, right? What are the moment to moment processes that will allow you to achieve that goal? Because if you only focus on that, you don't have a system set up. The next big idea from this is that of the conscious, subconscious, and the self image. And again, that self image kind of comes back to this idea of confidence of who do you feel you are? If you do not have a positive self image of your ability to succeed, if every time you do something, you think to yourself, oh man, that was dumb. Oh, I can't do that. That's not in my wheelhouse. I'm not as good as this person. We don't have a productive self image. So Lanny's big point in the book in terms of addressing this is every time you do something well, consciously note that. Ooh, I kept my back really tight. Ooh, I kept the bar close to me. Let's make a conscious note that that happened. As that happens more and more, it becomes part of your self-conscious, which gets integrated into your identity, into your self-image. Now it goes from, ooh, I kept the bar close to I keep the bar close. That's just how I lift. And that is powerful. Once you identify with a behavior, whether it's something like tracking your nutrition or a skill execution in the lift, then it's much easier to replicate because it's something you believe you are and you naturally do. The last key takeaway from this is the idea of mental rehearsal, sometimes called visualization. Again, something that's not uncommon in the sports psychology realm. Um, the big point in this is that everyone has a different type of visualization that works. Some people like to visualize themselves performing a movement, right? As if you're setting your hands on the bar, you're chalking up your hands, you're looking out to the audience. Uh, some people like to observe themselves in that visualization, meaning you're seeing yourself completing the lift. What's important in all of those is that you are visualizing an active process rather than an outcome, right? It comes back to what we talked about before, process is primary. Do not visualize yourself on the podium that is not active enough. Visualize yourself completing the lift the way you want to complete it. Number three is from Peak by Anders Ericsson. And actually this one's really, really exciting to me, but I'm also gonna recommend something that's very similar around the same vein, which is the talent code. They lean on the same body of research to produce that literary work. Peak is the scientist who did all of this research on mastery. The talent code includes a few more notes on culture development. It's also just a shorter read. So in his research, Anders Ericsson looked at masters of their craft, people who are seen as ingenues, as being gifted in whatever their field is, whether it's arts or athletics. And the one thing he came away with and realized is that this giftedness that we all think people have is the gift of adaptability meaning they have been able to consistently adapt their behavior, their processes for the outcome that they receive. Now diving a little bit deeper into that idea of adaptability, the big research that Anders Ericsson came out with is that of practice and different types of practice. And you're gonna see this quoted a bunch through different literatures. And I think it's really, really important to communicate to athletes, I know I do to my athletes a lot, is how are we practicing when we're in the gym? Because it really, really makes a difference. So the three types of practice that are covered in this book are naive practice, purposeful practice, and deliberate practice. Now let's talk about what those are just a little bit. Naive practice is the belief that if you just do something more that you'll get better at it, right? That sheer repetition will lead to desired outcomes. Uh, it's often looked at as mindless practice. I see this a lot, sorry to say everybody, but in the CrossFit space, I see athletes who come in and out and they think that just because 
a lift shows up in the wad that they're gonna get better at doing the lift. The problem is that they're not actively immersing themselves and they're not being intentional and purposeful about the way they do the lift. And so they never see progress. Then we have purposeful practice, which is honestly where the majority of good work happens. Purposeful practice includes a goal. Now, sometimes that might mean micro goals, right? Again, we talked about goals being these big umbrella things of what do I ultimately want to accomplish in one, five, 10 years? Then we've got smaller goals from that. But it can even be really, really micro goals like today, I'm gonna focus on locking out really hard. Today, I'm gonna focus on the connection to the bar during my turnover, right? Those would be good micro goals that contribute to purposeful practice. Second, purposeful practice requires focus. If you are not present to what you're doing, if you're not actually paying attention to the way your body's moving, to the way the bar is moving, that is not purposeful practice. The third attribute of purposeful practice is that there is feedback. So this is where coaching comes in and this is where things get a little tricky, right? Ideally, that feedback is immediate because then you can apply it right away. If it's not, maybe you're a remote athlete, you're training at a distance, then it's a matter of taking some initiative over that and communicating with your coach ahead of time of what do I need to be focused on? Maybe doing things like video where you can start to develop an eye for what it is you're actually doing and then being able to reverse engineer it and fix the thing that you need to fix. We don't have some kind of way of reflecting on our efforts, how do we know if we're going in the right direction? And the last big piece of purposeful practice is you have to leave your comfort zone. Now, in a sport like weightlifting, that's actually very easy. It's called periodization, right? We write it in as coaches. We know when an athlete is gonna start to reach and push into things that are gonna feel uncomfortable and we know when they're gonna back off. Now, one of the things that I really talk about in my ebook, No Pressure, No Diamonds, is there is a sweet spot of how much you need to overreach because too much, you're gonna set yourself up for failure, right? If we're too far outside of our skill set then we're gonna feel defeated, we're gonna have anxiety, it's gonna make us feel like we can't succeed. If you're not pushing enough, you're gonna get bored. And that's when we see stagnation. So there is a really, really important sweet spot of how much out of that comfort zone we need to be pushing. And if you wanna find out more, then definitely check out the link below and copy yourself that ebook, everybody. So I mentioned before that most of the time you're going to see purposeful practice be kind of the standard, but really, the gold star of types of practice. And this is something that we can do in weightlifting. It doesn't necessarily exist in all arts or sports is deliberate practice. Now, deliberate practice is everything that purposeful practice is, plus it considers the outcomes and expertise of top performers. So for us in weightlifting, that means we look at top level lifters. We look at Olympians. We look at national champions. What are they doing? How is their movement quality different? We can analyze bar path. We can look at programming models. We can compare the performances of different body types, right? There is a standard that we are able to compare it against to realize whether we're going in the right direction or not. I'm gonna leave you with one final note from Peak, and that is that we have the ability to consciously improve ourselves. Now, I say that specifically because if you remember, in our previous book, With Winning in Mind, one of the steps to improving or changing your self image or your identity is first conscious thought, right? We need to consciously understand what we're doing and know what behavior we wanna change. Once it becomes conscious, then we can move it into subconscious and then we can absorb it as to part of our identity but it starts with the ability to consciously change yourself. You cannot assume that behavior change happens instantly. It does require work initially, especially when you're doing things like fixing technique, that's kind of a big pain in the butt and a lot of people get frustrated with it, so they end up giving up. It needs to become conscious first and then you absorb it and then it integrates into who you are and the way you move and lift. Okay, we're getting there. Number four, this was one of my more recent reads and I'm a really big fan, it's called Grit by Angela Duckworth. And in this book, Angela was brought on to figure out how do gritty people succeed? What determines if somebody is gritty and will endure and be resilient and successful and who will quit? This one was a really, really interesting read because it identifies something that's really hard to pinpoint. Angela identifies what grit is and she defines it as the combination of passion 
and perseverance, right? We have to be incredibly passionate about something in order to stick with it long enough. If something has superficial interest to you, you're gonna give up on it quickly. And perseverance is you have to be willing to endure. And that's a really tough thing because endurance by definition is time consuming, right? If we need endurance in something, we need to be able to just keep plowing ahead for a really, really, really long time. A really big idea that's addressed in this book is the notion that effort counts twice. And she actually comes out with this great equation that reads talent times effort equals skill. Meaning if you have some innate talent and for our purposes, we're gonna define that as the ability to coordinate movement, right? That's to me what I think talent is in weightlifting because some people may be mobile, some people may be strong, some people may be fast, but if they can't coordinate movement, it's harder, okay? So that's talent, the ability to learn and coordinate movement times effort, meaning you take your own unique and innate abilities to be coordinated and to learn movement, you put a shit ton of work into it, and then you achieve skill. Now we have the skill of snatch, the skill of clean, of jerk. Then skill times effort again, so you take that skill and you keep hammering it in, you keep working at it, now we get achievement. So if we wanna accomplish something in our weightlifting careers, we start with talent, these abilities that we need to have, we put a lot of work into it, now we can do a thing, and then we take that thing and we put a lot more work into it. And then we get achievement. Effort counts twice. You need to put in the effort to achieve the skill first, to be able to do the lift. And then you need to put in work to be able to accomplish something with those lifts. And this is where I'm gonna to talk to my novices, my beginners out there, is that sometimes you think you're in the second equation when you're still in the first, right? You think that you already have the skill and now you're just putting in effort and you're trying to achieve something. But the problem is, you don't have that skill well enough to move on to the accomplishment or the achievement phase. It's not to say you're not gonna get there, but you have more work to do to really finesse that skill before we can take that skill. And now we're talking about putting in work for performance. Okay, so you might be wondering to yourself, well, how do I grow grit, right? If I'm not naturally a gritty person, if I tend to quit on things quickly, if I, don't have a habit of perseverance, if I'm not super sure I'm passionate about something, how do I grow grit? And she makes a really, really important point is that sometimes we think that grit grows from the inside out, but actually you can influence it outside in. So joining a gritty culture, that means a team that really pushes you and makes you strive to be your best self, having a coach that supports you and won't let up on you when you're not feeling your best. Those are ways that we can innately build that grit. You don't have to do it yourself. We can rely on the environment around you to help you build grit. But essentially growing grit has to contain four pieces. You have to have something you're interested in. You gotta be really interested in. If you wanna get better at something, you gotta like it. Two, you have to put in regular practice. Inconsistently showing up, we talked about it before, consistency is what makes champions. You have to put in consistent practice at that thing. Next, you have to have a purpose. This one sounds really heavy to some people. It's not like you wanna change the world with weightlifting. For some of us, it is. As a coach, I have a really big purpose of wanting to share weightlifting with as many people as possible. That's part of my purpose. For you, it might be you know, showing your social circle, your family, your friends that strength is empowering, that if you're a woman, maybe that strength is sexy, or that you can be strong at any age, or that, you know, whatever your thing that speaks to you is, you gotta have that. You have to have something bigger than yourself pushing you forward. And then lastly is you gotta have some kind of hope. This is kind of a, a tricky one to talk about because hope looks really different for a lot of people. I think that it's just the intrinsic belief that things are going to eventually work out. That to me is what hope is. Even if it requires a lot of work and a lot of time, that eventually good outcomes will happen. Uh, so we have to have a degree of that. If you only have negative mindsets that things are not gonna happen for you, things are not gonna work out, it's gonna be really hard to build that grittiness. Okay, and the last big point from this that actually really speaks to my coaches out there is if we want to build athletes, we need to simultaneously have high standards and high warmth. If we don't keep our standards high enough, we're not really doing that athlete a service, right? They're always gonna undershoot their bar. We need to push them up towards something that is really challenging for them and that is going to inspire them to wanna work harder. At the same time, high warmth. We have to be willing to nurture people and make sure that we have their back, not only when they're succeeding, but also if they're failing. 
Here we are, number five. The last big read that I want to leave you with is called Anti-Fragile. Anti-Fragile? Non-Fragile? <laughs> Anti-Anti-Fragile, whatever you wanna call it, by Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And this one was really cool to me and kind of goes hand in hand with grit, so I thought it was a good one to finish off with. In his book, Nassim talks about having three different types of personalities. One, we have people who are fragile. You know them. These are the people that the minute any little thing goes wrong, they fly off the handles, they break down, they get easily overwhelmed, they can't problem solve, everything just makes them break. The second is being resilient, which sounds really dope, right? Like, I wanna be resilient. But to his point, resilient people get hit by adversity and are okay, and that's cool you can definitely be resilient. But being anti-fragile means you get hit by adversity and you get better. You learn how to improve through adversity. Being anti-fragile means you grow through hardship. And that is ultimately what I want from all my athletes because hardship is unavoidable. It's just part of life, it's part of sport, it's part of training. At some point, something's gonna happen. Either you get sick, you get hurt, you have to move cross country, you have to take a break from training. Things happen in your life that derail your training. If those break you, you are a fragile athlete. If you are okay, but you stagnate for a while, you're resilient. If you take that and that shit fuels your fire, you are an anti-fragile athlete. So how do we become more anti-fragile? The notion that a lack of challenge causes people to undercompensate. So cool. So if something's not stimulating, it's not challenging enough, people settle. You can prepare for that kind of stuff with very, very simple things. Either training in different gyms if you can, or if you're always in your home gym, switching up where you look, switching up what platform you lift on, right? Adding novelty to your stimulus so that you learn to be more adaptable. I think particularly in weightlifting because it's such a repetitive sport, right? We wanna ingrain sameness in movement. Not having that capacity to be a little bit looser, a little bit more fluid is really crippling for some athletes. We can also become more anti-fragile by choosing the hard road. Very much in the same way that you would train your muscles, we can train this quality by choosing the harder option of little things whenever possible. That means loading bigger plates. You know who I'm talking to. If I need to put weight on the bar, I could easily just stack a bunch of change plates on there or grab smaller plates, or I can do the annoying, obnoxious, harder thing of busting out the 25s and putting those on the bar, right? Little things, setting up jerk blocks. We're talking about very commonplace activities that happen in a weightlifting hall that are sometimes annoyances that we avoid. Well, what happens if you don't avoid those? You get a little bit more resilient. You get a little bit more anti-fragile. One of the big ideas that's written about in here is something called the barbell strategy. And obviously that resonated with me. If you have a bar and it's evenly loaded, you have two diametrically opposed ideas. And those ideas are being simultaneously super conservative and super aggressive. How do you do that? Well, in our instance, it's going with full focus and intensity to your lift and then decompressing fully in between. Okay, that's it. I hope those ideas really, really help. Again, I can't stress enough how important that mental development is to your success as an athlete. Now, if you wanna learn a little bit more about those ideas, then definitely check out my ebook, No Pressure, No Diamonds. You're gonna see that link down below. We're gonna talk about the three most important aspects to developing that mindset as an athlete, and those are process, which we've talked about a little bit today. Identity, again, which we've touched on, everything from self-esteem to confidence to self-image, all of those compose identity. And then the last big takeaway that I talk about in my book is performance. And we go over things like choking or clarking that you might be familiar with. So thanks again. As always, hit that subscribe button, like this, check out some of my other videos. See you on the platform.